This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster. www.alexfoster.me.uk. The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells. Chapter Five: The Burglary at the Vicarage. The facts of the burglary at the vicarage came to us chiefly through the medium of the vicar and his wife. It occurred in the small hours of Whit Monday, the day devoted in Iping to the club festivities. Mrs. Bunting, it seems, woke up suddenly in the stillness that comes before the dawn, with the strong impression that the door of their bedroom had opened and closed. She did not arouse her husband at first, but sat up in bed, listening. She then distinctly heard the pad-pad-pad of bare feet coming out of the adjoining dressing-room, and walking along the passage towards the staircase. As soon as she felt assured of this, she roused the Reverend Mr. Bunting as quietly as possible. He did not strike a light, but putting on his spectacles, her dressing-gown, and his bath-slippers, he went out on to the landing to listen. He heard quite distinctly a fumbling going on at his study desk downstairs, and then a violent sneeze. At that he returned to his bedroom, armed himself with the most obvious weapon, the poker, and descended the staircase as noiselessly as possible. Mr. Bunting came out on the landing. The hour was about four, and the ultimate darkness of the night was past. There was a faint shimmer of light in the hall, but the study doorway yawned impenetrably black. Everything was still except the faint creaking of the stairs under Mr. Bunting's tread, and the slight movements in the study. Then something snapped, the drawer was open, and there was a rustle of papers. Then came an imprecation, and a match was struck, and the study was flooded with yellow light. Mr. Bunting was now in the hall, and through the crack in the door he could see the desk and the open drawer and a candle burning on the desk, but the robber he could not see. He stood there, in the hall, undecided what to do, and Mrs. Bunting, her face white and intent, crept slowly downstairs after him. One thing kept Mr. Bunting's courage, the persuasion that this burglar was a resident in the village. They heard the chink of money, and realised that the robber had found the housekeeping reserve of gold, two pounds ten in half-sovereigns altogether. At that sound Mr. Bunting was nerved to abrupt action. Gripping the poker firmly, he rushed into the room, closely followed by Mrs. Bunting. "'Surrender!' cried Mr. Bunting fiercely, and then stooped amazed. Apparently the room was perfectly empty. Yet their conviction that they had that very moment heard someone moving in the room had amounted to a certainty. For half a minute, perhaps, they stood gaping. Then Mrs. Bunting went across the room and looked behind the screen, while Mr. Bunting, by a kindred impulse, peered under the desk. Then Mrs. Bunting turned back the window curtains, and Mr. Bunting looked up the chimney and probed it with the poker. Then Mrs. Bunting scrutinised the waste-paper basket, and Mr. Bunting opened the lid of the coal-scuttle. Then they came to a stop and stood with eyes interrogating each other. "'I could have sworn,' said Mr. Bunting. "'The candle,' said Mrs. Bunting. "'Who lit the candle?' "'The drawer,' said Mr. Bunting. "'And the money's gone.' She went hastily to the doorway. "'Of all the strange occurrences!' There was a violent sneeze in the passage. They rushed out, and as they did so, the kitchen door slammed. "'Bring the candle,' said Mr. Bunting, and led the way. They both heard a sound of bolts being hastily shot back. As he opened the kitchen door, he saw through the scullery that the back door was just opening, and the faint light of early dawn displayed the dark masses of the garden beyond. He is certain that nothing went out of the door. It opened, stood open for a moment, and then closed with a slam. As it did so, the candle Mrs. Bunting was carrying from the study flickered and flared. It was a moment or more before they entered the kitchen. The place was empty. They refastened the back door examined the kitchen, pantry, and scullery thoroughly, and at last went down into the cellar. There was not a soul to be found in the house, search as they would. Daylight found the vicar and his wife, a quaintly costumed little couple, still marvelling about on their own ground floor by the unnecessary light of a guttering candle. CHAPTER Six: THE FURNITURE THAT WENT MAD now it happened that in the early hours of Whit Monday, before Milly was hunted out for the day, Mr. Hall and Mrs. Hall both rose and went noiselessly down into the cellar. 
their business there was of a private nature, and had something to do with the specific gravity of their beer. They had hardly entered the cellar when Mrs. Hall found she had forgotten to bring down a bottle of sarsaparilla from their joint room. As she was the expert and principal operator in this affair, Hall very properly went upstairs for it. On the landing he was surprised to see that the stranger's door was ajar. He went on into his own room and found the bottle as he had been directed. But returning with the bottle he noticed that the bolts of the front door had been shot back, that the door was in fact simply on the latch, and with a flash of inspiration he connected this with the stranger's room upstairs and the suggestions of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. He distinctly remembered holding the candle while Mrs. Hall shot these bolts overnight. At the sight he stopped, gaping, then with the bottle still in his hand went upstairs again. He rapped at the stranger's door. There was no answer. He rapped again, then pushed the door wide open and entered. It was as he had expected. The bed, the room also, was empty. And what was stranger, even to his heavy intelligence, on the bedroom chair and along the rail of the bed were scattered the garments, the only garments, so far as he knew, and the bandages of their guest. His big slouch hat, even, was cocked jauntily over the bedpost. As Hall stood there, he heard his wife's voice coming out of the depth of the cellar, with that rapid telescoping of the syllables and interrogative cocking up of the final words to a high note, by which the West Sussex villager is wont to indicate a brisk impatience. "'George, you got why one?' At that he turned and hurried down to her. "'Janny,' he said over the rail of the cellar steps, "'tis the truth what Henry says. He's not in his room yet, and the front door's unbolted.' At first Mrs. Hall did not understand, and as soon as she did she resolved to see the empty room for herself. Hall, still holding the bottle, went first. "'If he ain't there,' he said, "'his clothes are. And what's he doing without his clothes, then? To the most curious business.' As they came up the cellar steps, they both, it was afterwards ascertained, fancied they heard the front door open and shut. But seeing it closed and nothing there, neither said a word to the other about it at the time. Mrs. Hall passed her husband in the passage and ran on first upstairs. Someone sneezed on the staircase. Hall, following six steps behind, thought that he heard her sneeze. She, going on first, was under the impression that Hall was sneezing. She flung open the door and stood regarding the room. "'Of all the curious,' she said. She heard a sniff close behind her head, as it seemed, and turning, was surprised to see Hall a dozen feet off on the topmost stair. But in another moment he was beside her. She bent forward and put her hand on the pillow, and then under the clothes. "'Cold,' she said. "'He's been up this hour or more.' As she did so, a most extraordinary thing happened. The bedclothes gathered themselves together, leapt suddenly into a sort of peak, and then jumped headlong over the bottom rail. It was exactly as if a hand had clutched them in the centre and flung them aside. Immediately after, the stranger's hat hopped off the bedpost, described a whirling flight in the air through the better part of a circle, and then dashed straight at Mrs. Hall's face. Then as swiftly came the sponge from the washstand, and then the chair, flinging the stranger's coat and trousers carelessly aside, and laughing dryly in a voice singularly like the stranger's, turned itself up with his four legs at Mrs. Hall, seemed to take aim at her for a moment, and then charged at her. She screamed and turned, and then the chair legs came gently but firmly against her back, and impelled her and Hall out of the room. The door slammed violently and was locked. The chair and bed seemed to be executing a dance of triumph for a moment. Then abruptly everything was still. Mrs. Hall was left almost in a fainting condition in Mr. Hall's arms on the landings. It was with the greatest difficulty that Mr. Hall and Milly, who had been roused by her scream of alarm, succeeded in getting her downstairs and applying the restatives customary in such cases. "'Tis spirits,' said Mrs. Hall. "'I notice spirits. I read in papers and tables and chairs, leaping and dancing.' "'Take a drop more, Jenny,' said Hall. "'Twill steady ye.' "'Lock him out,' said Mrs. Hall. "'Don't let him come in again. "'I half-guessed I might have known, "'with them goggling eyes and bandaged head "'and never going to church of a Sunday, "'and all they bottles. "'More it's right for any one to have. "'He's put the spirits into the furniture. "'My good old furniture. "'Twas in that chair my very dear poor mother "'used to sit when I was a little girl. "'To think it should rise up against me now.' "'Just a drop more, Janny,' said Hall. "'Your nerves is all upset.' 
They sent Millie across the street through the golden five o'clock sunshine to rouse up Mr. Sandy Wadgers, the blacksmith. Mr. Hall's compliments, and the furniture upstairs was behaving most extraordinary. Would Mr. Wadgers come round? He was a knowing man, was Mr. Wadgers, and very resourceful. He took quite a grave view of the case. I'm damned if that ain't witchcraft, was the view of Mr. Sandy Wadgers. You want oar shoes for such gentry as he. He came round greatly concerned. They wanted him to lead the way upstairs to the room, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry. He preferred to talk in the passage. Over the way, Huxter's apprentice came out and began taking down the shutters of the tobacco window. He was called over to join the discussion. Mr. Huxter naturally followed over in the course of a few minutes. The Anglo-Saxon genius for parliamentary government asserted itself. There was a great deal of talk and no decisive action. "'Let's have the facts first, insisted Mr. Sandy Wadgers. "'Let's be sure we be acting perfectly right in busting that there door open. "'A door on bust is always open to busting, "'but you can't on bust a door once you've busted in.' "'And suddenly and most wonderfully, "'the door of the room upstairs opened of its own accord, "'and as they looked up in amazement, "'they saw descending the stairs the muffled figure of the stranger, "'staring more blankly and blankly than ever before, "'with those unreasonably large blue glass eyes of his.' He came down stiffly and slowly, staring all the time. He walked across the passage, staring, and then stopped. "'Look there,' he said, and their eyes followed the direction of his gloved finger and saw a bottle of sarsaparilla hard by the cellar door. Then he entered the parlour and suddenly, swiftly, viciously, slammed the door in their faces. Not a word was spoken until the last echoes of the slam had died away. They stared at one another. "'Well, if that don't lick everything,' said Mr. Wadgers, and left the alternative unsaid. "'I'd go in and ask about it,' said Wadgers to Mr. Hall. "'I'd demand an explanation.' It took some time to bring the landlady's husband up to that pitch. At last he rapped, opened the door, and got as far as, "'Excuse me.' "'Go to the devil,' said the stranger in a tremendous voice, and "'Shut that door after you.' So that brief interview terminated. Chapter 7 The Unveiling of the Stranger The stranger went into the little parlour of the coach and horses about half past five in the morning, and there he remained until near midday, the blinds down, the door shut, and none, after Hall's repulse, venturing near him. All that time he must have fasted. Thrice he rang his bell, the third time furiously and continuously, but no one answered him. "'Him and his go to the devil, indeed,' said Mrs. Hall. Presently came an imperfect rumour of the burglary at the vicarage, and two and two were put together. Hall, assisted by Wadgers, went off to find Mr. Shuckleforth, the magistrate, and take his advice. No one ventured upstairs. How the stranger occupied himself is unknown— now and then he would stride violently up and down, and twice came an outburst of curses, a tearing of paper, and a violent smashing of bottles. The little group of scared but curious people increased. Mrs. Huxter came over, some gay young fellows resplendent in black ready-made jackets and piquet paper ties, for it was Whit Monday, joined the group with confused interrogations. Young Archie Harker distinguished himself by going up the yard and trying to peep under the window blinds. He could see nothing, but gave reason for supposing that he did, and others of the Iping youth presently joined him. It was the finest of all possible Whit Mondays, and down the village street stood a row of nearly a dozen booths, a shooting gallery, and on the grass by the forge were three yellow and chocolate wagons, and some picturesque strangers of both sexes putting up a coconut shy. The gentlemen wore blue jerseys, the ladies white aprons, and quite fashionable hats with heavy plumes. Wadger, of the Purple Fawn, and Mr. Jaggers, the cobbler, who also sold old second-hand ordinary bicycles, were stretching a string of Union Jacks and Royal Ensigns, which had originally celebrated the first Victorian Jubilee, across the road. And inside, in the artificial darkness of the parlour, into which only one thin jet of sunlight penetrated, the stranger, hungry we must suppose, and fearful, hidden in his uncomfortable hot trappings, poured through his dark glasses upon his paper, or chinked his dirty little bottles, and occasionally swore savagely at the boys, audible if invisible, outside the windows. 
In the corner by the fireplace lay the fragments of half a dozen smashed bottles, and a pungent twang of chlorine tainted the air. So much we know from what was heard at the time, and from what was subsequently seen in the room. At noon he suddenly opened his parlour door, and stood glaring fixedly at the three or four people in the bar. "'Mrs. Hall,' he said. Somebody went sheepishly and called for Mrs. Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared after an interval, a little short of breath, but all the fiercer for that. Hall was still out. She had deliberated over this scene, and she came holding a little tray with an unsettled bill upon it. "'Is it your bill you're wanting, sir?' she said. "'Why wasn't my breakfast laid? Why haven't you prepared my meals and answered my bell? Do you think I live without eating?' "'Why isn't my bill paid?' said Mrs. Hall. "'That's what I want to know. "'I told you three days ago I was awaiting a remittance. "'I told you three days ago I wasn't going to await no remittances. "'You can't grumble if your breakfast waits a bit "'if my bill's been waiting these five days, can you?' "'The stranger swore, briefly but vividly. "'Nar, nar, from the bar. "'And I'd thank you kindly, sir, "'if you'd keep your swearing to yourself, sir,' said Mrs. Hall. The stranger stood looking more like an angry diving helmet than ever. It was universally felt in the bar that Mrs. Hall had the better of him. His next words showed as much. "'Look here, my good woman,' he began. "'Don't good woman me,' said Mrs. Hall. "'I've told you my remittance hasn't come.' "'Remittance indeed,' said Mrs. Hall. "'Still, I dare say in my pocket, "'you told me three days ago that you hadn't anything but a sovereign's worth of silver upon you.' "'Well, I've found some more. "'Hello, from the bar. "'I wonder where you found it,' said Mrs. Hall. "'That seemed to annoy the stranger very much. "'He stamped his foot. "'What do you mean?' he said. "'That I wonder where you found it,' said Mrs. Hall. "'And before I take any bills, or get any breakfasts, "'or do any such things whatsoever, "'you've got to tell me two things I don't understand, "'and what nobody don't understand, "'and what everybody is very anxious to understand.' I want to know what you've been doing to my chair upstairs, and I want to know how tis your room was empty, and how you got in again. Them as stops in this house comes in by the doors, that's the rule of the house, and that you didn't do. And what I want to know is how you did come in, and I want to know." Suddenly the stranger raised his gloved hands clenched, stamped his foot, and said, Stop! with such extraordinary violence that he silenced her instantly. You don't understand, he said, who I am or what I am. I'll show you. By heaven, I'll show you. Then he put his open palm over his face and withdrew it. The centre of his face became a black cavity. Here, he said, he stepped forward and handed Mrs. Hall something which she, staring at his metamorphosed face, accepted automatically. Then when she saw what it was, she screamed loudly, dropped it, and staggered back. The nose, it was the stranger's nose, pink and shining, rolled on the floor. Then he removed his spectacles, and every one in the bar gasped. He took off his hat, and with a violent gesture tore at his whiskers and bandages. For a moment they resisted him. A flash of horrible anticipation passed through the bar. "'Oh, my God!' said someone. Then off they came. It was worse than anything." Mrs. Hall, standing open-mouthed and horror-struck, shrieked at what she saw, and made for the door of the house. Everyone began to move. They were prepared for scars, disfigurements, tangible horrors. But nothing. The bandages and false hair flew across the passage into the bar, making a hobbledy-hoy jump to avoid them. Everyone tumbled on everyone else down the steps, for the man who stood there shouting some incoherent explanation was a solid, gesticulating figure up to the coat-collar of him, and then nothingness, no visible thing at all. People down the village heard shouts and shrieks, and looking up the street saw the coach and horses violently firing out its humanity. Then they saw Mrs. Hall fall down and Mr. Teddy Henfrey jump to avoid tumbling over her, and then they heard the frightful screams of Milly, who, emerging suddenly from the kitchen at the noise of the tumult, had come across the headless stranger from behind. These increased suddenly. Forthwith, everyone, all down the street, the sweet stuff seller, coconut shy proprietor and his assistant, the swing man, little boys and girls, rustic dandies, smart wrenches, 
smocked elders and aproned gypsies began running towards the inn, and in a miraculously short space of time a crowd of perhaps forty people, and rapidly increasing, swayed and hooted and inquired and exclaimed and suggested in front of Mrs. Hall's establishment. Everyone seemed eager to talk at once, and the result was Babel. A small group supported Mrs. Hall, who was picked up in a state of collapse. There was a conference, and the incredible evidence of a vociferous eyewitness. "'Oh, bogey! What's he been doing, then? Ain't hurt the girl, has he? Run at him with a knife, I believe. No head, I tell ye. It didn't mean no manner of speaking. I meant man without a head. Nonsense! Tis some conjuring trick. Fetched off his wrapping, he did. In its struggles to see in through the open door, the crowd formed itself into a straggling wedge, with the more adventurous apex nearest the inn. He stood for a moment, I heard the girl scream, and he turned. I saw her skirts whisk, and he went after her. Didn't take ten seconds. Back he comes with a knife in his hand and a loaf. Stood just as if he was staring. Not a moment ago. Went in that there door, I tell ye. He ain't got no head at all. You just missed him. There was a disturbance behind, and the speaker stopped to step aside for a little procession that was marching very resolutely towards the house. First Mr. Hall, very red and determined, then Mr. Bobby Jaffers, the village constable, then the wary Mr. Wadgers. They had come now, armed with a warrant. People shouted conflicting information of the recent circumstances. "'Ed or no Ed,' said Jaffers, "'I got a restin', and restin' I will.' Mr. Hall marched up the steps, marched straight to the door of the parlour, and flung it open. "'Constable,' he said, "'do your duty.' Jaffers marched in. Hall next, Wadgers last. They saw in the dim light the headless figure facing them, with a gnawed crust of bed in one gloved hand and a chunk of cheese in the other. "'That's him,' said Hall. "'What's the devil's this?' came in a tone of angry expostulation from above the collar of the figure. "'You're a damned rum customer, mister,' said Mr. Jaffers. "'But Ed or no Ed, the warrant says body, and duty's duty.' "'Keep off,' said the figure, starting back. Abruptly he whipped down the bread and cheese, and Mr. Hall just grasped the knife on the table in time to save it. Off came the stranger's left glove, and was slapped in Jaffers' face. In another moment, Jaffers, cutting short some statement concerning a warrant, had gripped him by the handless wrist and caught his invisible throat. He got a sounding kick on the shin that made him shout, but kept his grip. Hall sent the knife sliding along the table to Wadgers, who acted as goalkeeper for the offensive, so to speak, and then stepped forward as Jaffers and the stranger swayed and staggered towards him, clutching and hitting in. A chair stood in the way and went aside with a crash as they came down together. "'Get the feet,' said Jaffers between his teeth. Mr. Hall, endeavouring to act on instructions, received a sounding kick in the ribs that disposed of him for a moment, and Mr. Wadgers, seeing the decapitated stranger had rolled over and got the upper side of Jaffers, retreated towards the door, knife in hand, and so collided with Mr. Huxter and the Sidderbridge Carter coming to the rescue of law and order. At the same moment down came three or four bottles from the chiffonnier, and shot a web of pungency into the air of the room. "'I'll surrender,' cried the stranger, though he had Jaffers down, and in another moment he stood up panting, a strange figure, headless and handless, for he had pulled off his right glove now as well as his left. "'It's no good,' he said, as if sobbing for breath. It was the strangest thing in the world to hear that voice coming as if out of empty space. But the Sussex peasants are perhaps the most matter-of-fact people under the sun. Jaffers got up also and produced a pair of handcuffs. Then he stared. "'I say,' said Jaffers, brought up short by a dim realisation of the incongruity of the whole business. "'Darn it! Can't use him as I can see.' The stranger ran his arm down his waistcoat, and as if by a miracle the buttons to which his empty sleeve pointed became undone. Then he said something about his shin and stooped down. He seemed to be fumbling with his shoes and socks. "'Why,' said Huxter suddenly, "'that's not a man at all. It's just empty clothes. Look, you can see down his collar and the linings of his clothes. I could put my arm—' He extended his hand. It seemed to meet something in mid-air, and he drew it back with a sharp exclamation. "'I wish you'd keep your fingers out of my eye,' said the aerial voice, in a tone of savage expostulation. "'The fact is, I am all here—head, hands, legs, and all the rest. 
but it happens I'm invisible. It's a confounded nuisance, but I am. There's no reason why I should be poked to pieces by every stupid bumpkin in Iping, is it? The suit of clothes, now all unbuttoned and hanging loosely upon its unseen supports, stood up, arms akimbo. Several other of the men folks had now entered the room, so that it was closely crowded. "'Invisible, eh?' said Huxter, ignoring the stranger's abuse. "'Who ever heard the likes of that?' "'It's strange, perhaps, but it's not a crime. Why am I assaulted by a policeman in this fashion?' "'Ah, that's a different matter,' said Jarvis. "'No doubt you're a bit difficult to see in this light, but I got a warrant, and it's all correct. What I'm after ain't no invisibility, it's burglary, as a house been broken into and money took.' "'Well, and circumstances certainly point—' "'Stuff and nonsense,' said the invisible man. "'I hope so, sir, but I've got my instructions.' "'Well,' said the stranger, "'I'll come, I'll come, but no handcuffs.' "'It's the regular thing,' said Jaffers. "'No handcuffs,' stipulated the stranger. "'Pardon me,' said Jaffers. "'Abruptly the figure sat down, "'and before anyone could realise what was being done, "'the slippers, socks and trousers had been kicked off under the table. "'Then he sprang up again and flung off his coat.' "'Here, stop that!' said Jaffers, suddenly realising what was happening. He gripped at the waistcoat. It struggled, and the shirt slipped out off it and left it limply and empty in his hand. "'Hold him!' said Jaffers loudly. "'Once he gets the things off—' "'Hold him!' cried everyone, and there was a rush at the fluttering white shirt, which was now all that was visible of the stranger. The shirt-sleeve planted a shrewd blow in Hall's face that stopped his opened-armed advance and sent him backward into old Toothsome the sexton, and in another moment the garment was lifted up, became convulsed and vacantly flapping about the arms, even as a shirt that is being thrust over a man's head. Jaffers clutched at it, and only helped to pull it off. He was struck in the mouth out of the air, and incontinently threw his truncheon, and smote Teddy Henfrey savagely upon the crown of his head. "'Look out!' said everybody, fencing at random and hitting at nothing. "'Hold him! Shut the door! Don't let him loose! I got something! Here he is!' A perfect babel of noises they made. Everybody, it seemed, was being hit all at once, and Sandy Wadgers, knowing as ever, and his wits sharpened by a frightful blow in the nose, reopened the door and led the rout. The others, following incontinently, were jammed for a moment in the corner by the doorway. The hitting continued. Phipps, the Unitarian, had a front tooth broken, and Henfrey was injured in the cartilage of his ear. Jaffers was struck under the jaw, and turning, caught at something that intervened between him and Huxter in the melee, and prevented their coming together. He felt a muscular chest, and in another moment the whole mass of struggling, excited men shot out into the crowded hall. "'I got him!' shouted Jaffers, choking and reeling through them all, and wrestling with purple face and swelling veins against his unseen enemy. Men staggered right and left as the extraordinary conflict swayed swiftly towards the house door and went spinning down the half-dozen steps of the inn. Jaffers cried in a strangled voice, holding tight nevertheless and making play with his knee, spun around and fell heavily undermost with his head on the gravel. Only then did his fingers relax. There were excited cries of, Hold him! Invisible! and so forth, and a young fellow, a stranger in the place whose name did not come to light, rushed in at once, caught something, missed his hold, and fell over the constable's prostrate body. Halfway across the road a woman screamed as something pushed by her. A dog, kicked apparently, yelped and ran howling into Huxter's yard, and with that the transit of the invisible man was accomplished. For a space, people stood amazed and gesticulating, and then came panic and scattered them abroad through the village as a gust scatters dead leaves. But Jaffers lay quite still, face upward and knees bent, at the foot of the steps of the inn. End of chapter 7 Read in Nottingham, England on the 13th of March 2006 by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk